Right, and we're about uh, ready to go. Um, just talk in the afternoon session, depending on when you had your lunch. Um, so, uh, we're very pleased to have with us uh, Professor Lucy Green, who I'm sure many of you know. She's also Chief Stargazer of the Society of Popular Astronomy, so that's great. Uh, Lucy's going to tell us all about her work on trying to understand the closest star, our sun. Lovely, thank you very much. Well, it is a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and it's great to see such an amazing turnout. I heard there might be a H-Alpha solar telescope outside. Has anyone had a look at the sun yet today? Yeah, great. Any features on the sun? No. No. <laughs> it is declining in its activity. Yeah. Oh, okay. Tim's the master here. <laughs> so, so there's not much on the sun at the moment, which is... Fair enough, because it is declining in its activity and approaching solar minimum. But it is still a fascinating star to study. And what I want to do this afternoon is give a sort of an extended introduction, which is a look at the current status of our sun as an active star and the phenomena that we see happening in the sun's atmosphere. Um, but I'm also doing a bit of a shameless plug for my book, which you can see on the screen. And in the book, I'm trying to tell the story of how much history there is in solar physics and how much we've had to do and achieve and learn to try and understand something as simple as a star. Oh, 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 oh I'm back. Right. Woo! Oh, don't move. Screen's going, voice going. <laughs> yes, I'm very still. <laughs> right, I'm just going to plow on and if it gets really bad maybe we can swap mics. So through the talk, I'll start off by having a look at what we know about the sun at the moment, and then have a look at the history of how we got to this point, and including a bit of information about who I see as perhaps the most important person in solar physics. They made a huge contribution and changed our understanding of the sun, and so I think any talk about the history of the sun wouldn't be complete without this particular person. Um, as another point, the front cover of the book has a picture of the sun in a particular wavelength of extreme ultraviolet light. Now, I chose that particular picture at that time for a particular reason. So if you start to drift off during my talk, you can have a ponder about why you think I might have chosen that particular image of the sun and what it might correspond to. But let's start by having a look at the sun as seen from space. And so I always like to start my talks by showing this kind of image. Okay, the aspect ratio is way out, I think. The sun looks rather stretched north to south. But anyway, we all know it's uh, spherical. So this is an, an image of the sun taken in the wavelength of light that our eyes can detect. So this is just visible light. And it's light that comes from a region of the sun called the photosphere. But the light itself was generated in the core of the sun under these huge um, temperatures and pressures so 15 million degrees um, uh, reflects the temperature in the centre of the sun. That's why we gave it as the title of the book. And under the, in those in extreme conditions, the material of the sun is being fused together, liberating energy that we see at the surface in the form of sunlight. And I remember learning quite early on that the light generated in the centre of the sun is in the form of gamma rays, very high energy radiation, and it takes over 170,000 years for that light to escape the centre of the sun, trickling through the really dense material before it gets to the surface, has lost enough energy to be in the visible part of the spectrum, and then we see it with our eyes. And I just find that remarkable. So the sunlight that you see isn't actually eight minutes old, which is the time it takes to get from the surface to us. It's as old as modern humans ourselves. It's around 200,000 years old, which I find absolutely remarkable. So this was the early way of looking at the sun, using visible light. But the way that we continually look at the sun now is by using telescopes in space. And that opens up a whole range of electromagnetic radiation that you can see. Because the sun is this amazing object that emits not only invisible light, but also extreme ultraviolet, ultraviolet x-rays, radio waves, um, gamma rays microwaves, it emits across the spectrum. So when we go to space, we tend to take pictures like this, oops, which is an image of the sun in extreme ultraviolet light. It's taken, oh, I just heard someone at the front say, it's amazing, thank you, sir. <laughs> That's exactly what I think. So the sun really comes to life. You see it as this object with 
an atmosphere that looks very three-dimensional, whereas you could see sunspots in the visible image of the sun. This image, taken at exactly the same time, shows the million-degree atmosphere sitting above that surface. And you see loops, you see darker regions. Some of you who are familiar with filaments and prominences might even be able to pick up those structures in this image. Um, but it is remarkably varied, and it changes with time. So that's what I wanted to illustrate in this um, animation here, this video here. So this is the same, um, taken at the same time, the same data. But what we've done here is processed a series of images in a way that brings out changes happening in the sun's atmosphere. So where the, the image remains grey, not much is happening. But where you start to see colour, brightenings and, and, um, and, and intensifications, that's where the, um, the, the sun's atmosphere is changing. So if I run the movie, you see it flickering a little bit, that's just an artifact of the processing. You start to see a solar flare and an eruption taking off from the sun's atmosphere. And I just find these absolutely remarkable. So what you're seeing here is the birth, and again, of something called a coronal mass ejection. So just what it says on the tin, it's an eruption of mass from the sun's corona, from its atmosphere. And these eruptions can carry around the mass of a mountain into space with speeds of, well, I think the fastest I've ever seen has been moving at around 2,500 kilometers a second. <laughs> so they really pack a punch. And for the last 20 years, um, my career has been around trying to understand why these events happen and how they happen. And it's not been easy. But you think about the energies involved in launching something that size into the solar system. And to give you a bit of um, context, the sun is around 110 <coughs> Earths wide. So these are really significant sized events in the sun's atmosphere. They start off large, but as you can see, these things expand very rapidly. And um, later on, I'm going to show you some images, in fact, in my next slide, um, to show the size that these um, eruptions become as they propagate out into the solar system. So this is another movie showing data taken with a different telescope, still a space-based telescope. But now what we have is the equivalent to a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse. You can see there's a black arm coming from the bottom left, and that holds a disk in front of the photosphere. So that blocks out all of the intense visible radiation. And what it allows us to pick up um, are photons of light scattered by structures in the sun's very extended atmosphere. So you might just about be able to make out these radial features coming out from the sun. And that's, that's its larger scale atmosphere. You can see some stars in the background. But when I run the movie, you'll see what happened to that eruption as it left the sun. Now, these movies are sped up in time. This one runs, I think, for about seven hours. So if I play it, you see this thing come out. It becomes larger than the sun itself. So this bubble of material explosively ejects itself into the solar system. And it expands very rapidly as it moves into the very low density gas of the sun's upper atmosphere. So that's a very classic coronal mass ejection. Now, if I play the same movie again, but allow time to run a bit further on, so this movie runs around 11 hours, we'll start to see another associated form of solar activity. So I press play. Here's the coronal mass ejection. It leaves the sun. And now you see, start to see the detector being uh, completely bombarded by electrically charged particles that we think are accelerated as this expanding cloud of material sort of snow plows into the solar system through the sun's atmosphere. If it moves fast enough, it can generate a shock at its leading edge, and within that shock, you can accelerate particles. So these are protons that we're picking up here with the detector. Now, to give you an idea of how fast they're traveling, the coronal mass ejection will take somewhere between one and four days to reach the Earth if it is traveling towards us. So that's through the 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles between us and the sun. So it take a few days. These particles 
can get to us within uh, 40 minutes. So they really do travel close to the speed of light. And it's these kind of particles that astronauts sometimes talk about. Um, when astronauts have closed their eyes whilst they're in space, they sometimes see flashes of light. And it's these high energy electrically charged particles coming into their eyes. And a few years ago, I don't know if you saw Stargazing Live when we had Buzz Aldrin on the show. Mm -hmm. So exciting to meet him. And so I thought, right, I can ask him. These are the first people going to the moon. Did they see this? And he said to me that he was the first person to notice these particles uh, or, or to notice the flashes of light in his eyes. Um, I'm not sure whether he was or perhaps Neil Armstrong was. He said there was a massive um, competitiveness between the two of them to be the best. So <laughs> apparently Neil Armstrong, when he told him the story about seeing the flashes, said, oh yeah, I saw them too, and you know, I saw more. <laughs> I guess that drive is what gets you to the moon. So that's two forms of solar activity, um, chrono mass ejections and then these very high energy particles that get ejected into the solar system. Some of you will have seen the next movie I want to show you um, before because it is my favourite movie of a coronal mass ejection. So now we're looking at the sun, we're looking at a layer of the atmosphere called the chromosphere. So for those of you who have H-alpha filters, hydrogen alpha filters, this is the layer of the atmosphere that you're looking at. Um, the gases here are slightly hotter than what you see through the H-alpha filter, but it's essentially the same part of the atmosphere. You can see probably only the people at the front, there's a prominence extending off the sun in the south, there's some bright patches that correspond to the sunspot regions. But this event happened in 2011. Now, you can't tell just by looking at this image which region is going to erupt, I don't think. And it completely took us surprise, by surprise when it happened. I've got my size scale on again, just as a reminder that there's 110 Earths lined up wide. But let's have a look at the eruption. It happens from this region here. And in June 2011, beautiful, isn't it? I mean, it was so spectacular to see this. A huge cloud of material, exactly, material fell back to the sun because it was so massive. And in my team, we've spent a lot of time trying to understand why such a massive eruption could happen. Um, and one of my PhD students has been looking at events that happen in the low solar atmosphere to build up a very massive structure. And then the work I do is looking at actually how that material can erupt into space, and I'll uh, come back to that later on. So that's the, that's the event just seen in the straight data. Of course, we've also processed the data to show it in one of these difference images, and this is how it looks. So you really get the sense of this huge bubble of material expanding, and it does so over, well, I think the movie runs for a few hours. And again, you see that material falling back to the surface of the sun, it starts to be compressed as it falls down, that heats it, and then you see sort of brightenings as the material impacts uh, the lower solar atmosphere. I love the fact that it has such a large um, um, effect across the sun. So this material probably fell down over around a half of the sun's uh, surface. So it really had a global um, impact on the sun's atmosphere. But there's one other kind of solar activity that we've been monitoring very closely from space and that's something called a solar flare. So to show you what a solar flare looks like, again, I've got images of the sun taken in extreme ultraviolet light. Um, the movie on the right-hand side is taken from NASA's stereo spacecraft, which are at remote points in the solar system away from the Earth. And if I run the movie, you'll see the solar flare manifesting itself as this bright flash of light in the sun's atmosphere. And that, that's what a flare is. Again, it does what it says on the tin. It's a brightening, a sudden sporadic brightening that we see in the sun's atmosphere. And you might see it in visible light if it is really intense. Otherwise, they shine really brightly in ultraviolet light and X-ray emission. And they're typically the wavelengths of light that we use to study solar flares. Uh, this is another movie taken by NASA's SOHO telescope. Same wavelength of light. And that's shown actually by the fact we colour code the movies with the same green colour to tell us it's the same wavelength of light that's being used. This is a fairly old event now that took place on the sun um, in 2000. So the sun was extremely active at this time, it was close to solar maximum. That's reflected by the fact that there are lots of bright patches in the sun's atmosphere <coughs> that are regions of hot gas above sunspots. So lots of sunspots, 
height of activity, and because of that, lots of corona mass ejections and lots of solar flares. So if I run this movie, you'll see the event happening. Oops, I think that should run. Yes, here we go. So now there's an event taking in the centre of the sun. So it ran incredibly fast, actually. Did you see the flash of light that happens, and then the particles hitting? And actually, what is not possible to see here is that simultaneously we have a solar flare happening, a coronal mass ejection being launched from that site, and then this particle event. And this is very typical when you look at the sun. For the biggest events, you'll have all three forms of solar um, activity happening together. So not only do we try and ha have to try and understand one of the phenomena, we have to understand how the three relate to each other. So there we are, solar flares, corona mass ejections, and the particles. And as well as looking at the sun's atmosphere, you can look inside the sun. And that's a sort of, I want to take a little detour just to talk about something that we um, looked at a few years ago now. So my job has always been to look at these eruptions and look at the impacts and consequences of it in the sun's atmosphere. But a few years ago, we were looking at an event that happened in 2011. And, um, well, I'll talk you through the movie. So we've got the EUV data of the sun in the middle. <coughs> we've got the eclipsed um, images of the sun superimposed around it. So you, that's shown in, in red. And a region in the southern hemisphere produced a very large solar flare and a very fast corona mass ejection. So as I play the movie, you'll see that activity. But I want you to look to see if you can um, pick out the coronal mass ejection, which was ejected out towards us, so it appears as a faint halo around the sun. So if I run, whoops, I'm moving out, I'm very well. Let's use the laptop. Okay, here we go. So there's the flash. Of light, can you just about make out that? Yep, and now we zoom in just to see the event again. And this event was so energetic, we're zooming in again, that not only did it have an impact in the sun's atmosphere, but it also had an impact on the interior of the sun. And this shows the surface response. Did you see that? <laughs> so, this event produced something that we call sunquakes. And some quakes have been known about for a long time, but they haven't typically been associated to coronal mass ejections. So I've got the movie of the surface response, just to show you again. You might have seen that flash of light at the start, which was the flare and the CME taking off. And then something happened to set off this sunquake. Now, sunquakes are seen as ripples, circular ripples propagating out from the central point. And here, actually, there are two sunquakes. You might be able to spot, there's the obvious one on the left, and there are some fainter ripples on the right-hand side, not necessarily complete circles. <coughs> so this, again, was something that we got fascinated by. So I just want to um, introduce you a bit more to what sunquakes are. So this is the, a movie um, made from the first sunquake that was ever observed on the sun in 1996. And I think it looks like someone's dropped a pebble in a pond and caused the surface of the sun to sort of have uh, ripples that propagate out. But that's actually not what's happening. It's more accurate to think of a sunquake as being almost like a, um, a drum being hit by a hammer, a sound wave being created, but a sound wave that goes into the sun. And then as it goes into the interior, it starts to bend and gets refracted back to the surface of the sun, where it gets reflected, and so it goes straight back in again. And it does this sort of, um, I don't know, scallops dance around under the surface of the sun. And I've got a figure here to try and illustrate that. So what you're seeing at the surface of the sun are sound waves that have gone in, been turned back to the surface, lifted it, and then gone back in again. Been turned, come back to the surface, and lifted it. And then what you see, because this is happening all around the spot where the hammer hit, is these circles of um, movement of the, of the um, surface of the sun. So these are remarkable. So by looking at the motion of the surface of the sun, we can work out that sound waves bounce around inside, some of them created by these eruptions that we see. And um, this technique of using sound to effectively see inside the sun is quite commonly used in Britain. 
So there's a university in Birmingham that does a lot of work on this. But we were just interested in the fact that an explosion upwards could have um, a transfer of energy and have an impact into the sun itself. Right, I think I need to move on. So, I think perhaps for me, the most important thing that we've learned about the sun during the space age, it is all this activity that we've discovered and analysed, but it's been a sort of mind change that we've had about the sun and what the sun means for us here on the Earth. And I want to try and illustrate that with this movie. So again, this is data taken from spacecraft. The data come from two different spacecraft in two remote parts of the solar system. They're called the NASA Stereo spacecraft. They were launched in 2006, and effectively they were sent off around, well, they were put into orbit around the sun. One spacecraft moves more slowly than the Earth does, so it started to lag behind. The other spacecraft moves more quickly, so it shot ahead of us. So if we have the Sun-Earth line running down the centre of this auditorium, and I'm the Earth, one satellite is around one side of the Sun, and the other satellite is around the other. So you get those two, those two different views on the side of the Sun, but also of the Sun-Earth line. And that's what's shown here. So it's a bit of a sort of mosaic of images. The sun is in the centre, now it's that tiny orange speck. On the left hand side, you see the view from one spacecraft, which has the Earth in its field of view, that's us. And then the other spacecraft, that, the view from that spacecraft is shown on the other side. So it's a bit complex, but it's basically showing us the space between the sun and the Earth. You can see stars in the background again. But what for me is remarkable is, is what you see when I run the movie. So all the time, material is flowing out from the sun, both in the form of what we call the coronal mass ejections, but also with something called the solar wind, which is nothing more than the sun's hot million degree atmosphere pushing its way out into space, overcoming gravity and escaping the sun. So all the time the sun is losing material, losing material. And that creates a huge bubble in the solar system that we call the heliosphere. And the Earth and all the other planets, all the asteroids are inside the heliosphere. So that means we are inside the sun's atmosphere. We are all living in the sun's atmosphere. And that was a huge discovery when the first space probes were sent beyond the Earth into this material. They could sniff it and sense it. They worked out what it was made of, how fast it was moving, and that it was always flowing out over us. Absolutely remarkable. This solar wind and these coronal mass ejections that blast away from the sun have an impact on us, and I'm going to mention that briefly. But they also have an impact on things like this. This is Comet Enkit. Can you see it just about in the sort of bottom half of the image? Lots and lots of stars being picked up in the background by these very sensitive cameras. But again, if I run the movie, the sun's on the right-hand side. <laughs> CME blows over the comet, it loses its tail. So it slips it off. <laughs> they reform it again, but it can happen over and over again. So very real effects of the sun's ex expanding atmosphere. So comets are sitting in the solar wind, but also so are we. So I just have one slide to summarise what that means for us. And a lot of my time now, as well as looking at corona mass ejections and trying to understand the physics behind them, is looking at what the impact is for us uh, here on the Earth. And I sort of categorise the impact by the form of solar activity. So on the left-hand side, we've got these corona mass ejections. Now, when they reach the Earth, they impact the Earth's magnetic field. They shake it up. They energise it. That moving... Earth's magnetic field, or the motion of the Earth's magnetic field, sets up electric currents. Those currents can flow high up in our atmosphere, producing the northern and southern lights. They can flow through the ground, but they can also flow through our electricity networks, causing voltage fluctuations and heating and transformers. And over the decades, we've seen lots of impacts on electricity grids. Um, in the UK, we haven't had any major problems. There's a big storm in 1989, 
you may have seen the aurora at that time in the south of England. It must have been good up in the north of England. And uh, National Grid had some problems with transformers, with two transformers, but nothing major. But as a consequence today, National Grid uh, look at space weather forecasts issued by the Met Office. So you can get your weather forecast and your space weather forecast now to see what's happening in the nearer space environment. Because if we lose our power networks, then you get cascading failures following from that. The government doesn't want the lights to go out. Um, from solar flares, when the light reaches the Earth's atmosphere, it changes its, um, uh, its electrical composition. So it, it can tear apart atoms and ionize the particles. It can heat it, causing it to expand. Satellites feel more drag. And the energetic particles, when they get here, so I mentioned with astronauts, they see the flashes of lights in their eyes, but actually you don't want your astronauts to be bombarded by these ionizing particles. You could get radiation sickness, cancer, all kinds of problems. But also, um, at air aircraft altitudes. So there's work that's been going on to look at what the impact of high energy charged particles is on people who are working in the aviation industry. So as a solar scientist, it's sort of surprising to me that I've ended up having conversations with National Grid, with Virgin Airlines, with the government, to try and help mitigate the risks of what we call collectively space weather. So that was my very extended introduction, <laughs> to try and uh, illustrate the phenomenal power of the sun, but also how varied it is, how dynamic it is, and how exciting and interesting it is, but also the real um, everyday relevance. So now I just want to spend perhaps 15, 20 minutes looking at the journey to get to this point. Because we began with this kind of observation of the sun. Um, on the left-hand side, I have an image of the first record of a sunspot, or sunspots, taken by Thomas Harriot in Britain in uh, 1610. And I just I love this drawing. You probably can't make out the text next to it, but he doesn't actually refer to the sunspots at all. And I wonder if that's because if you are the first person to make a record of the sun, looking through a telescope, that is, you don't necessarily know what you're going to see or how to interpret what you do see. So what he does talk about is looking at the sun through his telescope at dawn when there's mist on the horizon, so he's trying to diminish the amount of sunlight coming to him. But he has to keep changing his eye very quickly, his left eye, his right eye, his left eye, his right eye. And you can just imagine, him, oh, it's bright, it's bright, it's bright. Of course, we'd never do that today, and you all know that in this room, but the early observers weren't necessarily aware of the risks, but the blink reflex still comes in because you're dazzled by what you're looking at. So that's the first drawing that we know of showing spots that we now interpret as being on the surface of the sun. Much more famous for sunspot drawings is Galileo, and his drawings from the summer of 1612 are shown in the animation on the bottom right. I mean, it, it was incredible what could be learned from those early observations. The sun isn't perfect, it's spinning, taking around a day, uh, sorry, 27 days to spin once. But the spin rate varies with latitude on the sun. You can see a lot of structure in the sunspots there too. But our knowledge about the sun from the early 1600s onwards sort of gathered slowly and developed slowly. And for me, it was about recording numbers of sunspots, working out that the sun had this 11-year sunspot cycle. You could see where the spots were, how they formed, that they disappeared seemingly without a trace. But to really understand what they were, we have to fast forward into the 1800s. So we've had a couple of hundred years of telescope observations by this point. And I think one of the most important developments in our knowledge came from Michael Faraday. And this is a picture from Michael Faraday's um, notebooks. And you can go and see them in the Royal Institution. They show iron filings that he's, he puts into melted wax on pieces of paper and then put magnets underneath them. And then as the wax hardened, the shapes of the magnetic field as revealed by the iron filings were captured. So these are, what, 150 years old. They're slightly rusty now, 
Because otherwise, they're pretty good. And you can make out here, there are three magnets, one on the left, one in the middle, and one of them on the right. And it's that classic, you know, it's a small experiment. I still have iron filings and magnets at work. I love to do this. So you see the shapes of the magnetic fields revealed in the response of the iron filings. And there are some more pictures here. This is his experiment using electric currents passed through wires. And when you do that, you set up a magnetic field. And again, you make these circular patterns in the iron filings. So this is the basic physics behind the aurora, this relationship between electricity and magnetism. <coughs> so by, by the time we get into the 1800s, and definitely by the end of the 1800s and the start of the 1900s, after almost 300 years of telescope observations, we are finally at the point where we can start to understand sunspots. So 300 years. By that point in time, we had a description of magnetism. We had discovered the electron, negatively charged particle. There was ideas around electricity and magnetism. So if you moved electrically charged particles, you generated a magnetic field. And there was also ideas or knowledge that you could detect a magnetic field at a distance if the magnetic object was emitting light. So this is where we start to come back to the sun. And this is where I want to introduce who I think is the most important person in solar physics. Some of you might have heard of him. George Ellery Hale. Some people, yeah. American astronomer. It took me a while to find out about him. I have to say, I think he should be more well known than he is. He was an amazing person. He was the son of very wealthy parents. He had a very strong interest in astronomy from an early age. His father built him a magnificent observatory in the back garden. So good that it was research grade. But he had such an inquisitive mind. He was a really good scientist and he was a really good engineer. And his interest in astronomy and his skill at telescope making led him to, um, to do studies of the sun. And he built telescopes then that could look at the sun's lights across the visible spectrum, but he also designed a telescope that could pick out sun's light just at very narrow wavelengths. So he was able to build the first, or well, his first, H-alpha telescope that would just look at the sun's light in that narrow portion of, of the spectral range. Um, and this is one of his earliest images. Oops. So it looks very grainy, the plate is broken. Um, this is held in America at the Carnegie Observatories. So this is the chromosphere of the sun as seen in 1908 in an image taken by George Owen Hale. You can see there's a lovely filament snaky across the sun in the bottom. There's a couple of sunspots on the top right hand side, all kinds of structure. And it was Hale looking at the sun in H-alpha that was to be the, the reason why we discovered what sunspots are. So I want to show you what he saw, but it's quite difficult in this image. So I've got a modern day image of the sun in H-alpha. And I'm going to zoom in. Um, that's the white light image showing this huge sunspot. So I'm going to zoom in to that sunspot. Right. So you can start to see some structure. So you see that it looks a bit like a whirlwind. And probably some of you are familiar with seeing these kind of curved shapes in the chromosphere. And so George Ellery Hale, he read widely about science. And in his mind, he synthesized or um, aggregated this information. And he, he thought, well, this looks like a vortex. And he said to himself, well, I know that the sun is a hot object. And I know that hot gases might have the particles ripped apart into electrons and protons. And I know that if I have moving electrically charged particles, I can generate magnetic fields. So he started to think, well, maybe sunspots are regions of strong magnetic field on the surface of the sun. But because he had the ability to build telescopes, he was also able to build a telescope that could detect magnetic fields. And that's what he did. And in 1908, he made the first discovery of a magnetic field beyond the Earth in these sunspots. And it allowed us to work out, finally, what they are after 300 years of observations. So now we know that sunspots are like the intersection of a column of magnetic field that passes from the inside of the sun 
and into the atmosphere. And in those regions, gas cools down, so it appears darker than the surrounding surface. And maybe you might remember back to those early images I showed you of those eruptions. You might have noticed all those loops in the sun's atmosphere that then expand to produce the corona mass ejection. They are loops of plasma trapped within those magnetic fields. So they're loops of plasma trapped in magnetic field configurations. And I couldn't do my job if we didn't have this knowledge. So everything I do comes back to magnetic fields in the atmosphere of the sun. They form the sunspots, they form the arc structures, <coughs> they store and release energy, and that's what powers the solar flares, the corona mass ejections, the sunquakes. They're like batteries on the surface of the sun <coughs> in the sun's atmosphere. And this discovery was so important that it led um, Hale to be invited to Britain. But um, one of the other things I discovered when I went into the Royal Institution archives to look at Faraday's lab books was a very nice transcript of a Friday evening discourse that um, Arthur Eddington gave in 1909. So Arthur Eddington might be another name that you know. Very, very significant um, mathematician and astronomer working at Cambridge University. And uh, here's the transcript that I found. So he was giving a talk, as was the custom and still is, a Friday night discourse, and he'd been invited to talk about Saturn. That was his topic, Saturn and the moons of Saturn. I forget how many they knew about at this time in 1909. But if you zoom in, he says he can't resist at the end of his talk <coughs> referencing Hale. So he says that he cannot close this discourse without alluding to what is perhaps the greatest result of any recent years that, it, that recent years have recorded to astronomy. And then he says about George Ellery Hale, he has gone farther and shown, I believe, to the satisfaction of physicists, the picky bunch, that the light passing up through these vortices bears the sure marks of having passed through a strong magnetic field. So those vortices around sunspots shows the um, shows information about the magnetic field in those regions. So Hale's discovery of the magnetic sun has been absolutely phenomenal to us, and it, it runs through all of solar physics research now. So just to move on then, I've only got a few more slides to show. I want to come back, bring us back to the modern time. So in 1908, Ellery Hale made his discovery, and from then we can start to progress. So our ideas and observations about the atmosphere of the sun <coughs> finally become based around physics. Um, I show this because this is one of my favourite pre-space age drawings of the sun during an eclipse that took place in um, 1860. And this was a drawing made in Spain. So you see the beautiful eclipse sun, those radial features that you saw in the first space-based movie there. There's some prominences off the um, limb of the sun. But you'll also notice that circular feature to the top. So that, we think now, is a coronal mass ejection that just happened to be taking place when this drawing was made during those few minutes of totality. We didn't discover coronal mass ejections until the 1970s, so this was almost 100 years ahead of its time. And I, just, I wonder if there are any other drawings that captured something like this in progress. But this was the kind of standard way of looking at the sun's atmosphere pre-space age you relied on the tide of total solar eclipses. But after the Second World War, German rocket scientists and their rockets surrendered to America. They got hold of bits of 100 of these rockets. These are the V2 rockets. And this is one of the early rocket launches. So NASA, well, yes, NASA would have been, uh, no, NASA wasn't formed at that point. NASA was formed in 1958. In the early years after the Second World War, our space research era began, and it began with these rockets, getting up high um, into high altitudes and seeing the sun's light unhindered by the Earth's atmosphere. No absorption, no loss of wavelengths, we could see everything. So observations started to become <coughs> regularly made. But there was still this problem of these rocket flights lasting a few minutes, so you just get a brief view of the sun. So they realised that actually to catch 
the solar activity happening. To catch a flare, you had to do something a bit clever with these rockets. Because you might not, when you launch a rocket, the chances of catching a flare in progress are pretty slim. A flare might last for a few minutes. So you've got to launch a rocket at exactly the right time. But you can't just leave your rocket on the launch pad for days and days and days until a ground-based telescope sees what's happening and then send it up. That would take up valuable um, uh, space. So what they decided was to create something called a rockloon. Here's a picture of one. So it's a balloon that gets lofted, drifts around for a few days with a rocket hanging underneath it. A ship follows the rocket and the balloon, and then when they get the radio signal to say, oh, a ground-based telescope using the H-alpha filter has seen a flare going off, they would launch the rocket straight through the balloon, solving the problem of what to do with that, and make the observations of the solar flare. So these rockets, I think, are brilliant. We don't use them anymore, but there's a part of me that sort of feels like perhaps it would be quite fun to go and do that. Um, so that, that was the start of the space era. But I can't talk about space observations without also mentioning this. So this is Skylab, yeah, my favourite space observatory. It was a mission launched by NASA once the moon programme had finished. So they changed their focus from the moon over towards the sun. And because they didn't need all three stages of the Saturn V rocket um, just for low Earth orbit work, they turned the third <laughs> stage into an orbiting science laboratory. They were doing studies about the effect of and space on humans, but they also had a very sophisticated series of solar telescopes on what was called the Apollo Telescope Mount. <coughs> and also what I love is that the astronauts were trained in solar physics before they went into space, so that they could operate the telescopes and they would know what to observe and they would know what data to collect. So for a brief window of time, we had solar physicists in orbit around the Earth. So that was Skylab. So we're moving into the space area now. And let's have a look at how observations of, our, of the sun's atmosphere evolved over that time. The very first image of the sun's hot X-ray emitting atmosphere as seen from a rocket is this one. This is an image taken with a pinhole camera on a rocket. Now, it's a bit misleading because it looks like you see giant arches in the atmosphere, which you might expect because of the magnetic fields. But actually, this rocket rolled and it smeared out the features. So they're not real. <laughs> There's a bright blob and it got smeared into the arch. But you can see X-ray emission from the sun, which was a huge step forward because you can't detect that from the Earth's surface. So we come further forward in time. This is the view from the Skylab space station. Again, in x-rays, much more detail now. You can start to see these regions of hot emit x-ray emitting gas trapped in magnetic fields um, above the sunspots. And then we come further forward in time to the Yoko satellite. And you can just see that increase in resolution of your x-ray images. So I think I'm going to finish now by showing you then the image that we started off with at the beginning of the talk. This is one of the latest um, um, images of the sun taken by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. You can see all that structure. And there's my final point. I want to overlay it with our model oops, of the magnetic field in that atmosphere, shown by all these white lines. Incidentally, Faraday gave us the concept of magnetic field lines to allow us to communicate this, so another reason he was incredibly important to us. But you can see the mapping between these, um, these loops and the emission structures in the atmosphere of the sun. So I hope that has given you a feeling for the dynamic side of our sun, that it took us the knowledge generated over 300 years to get to the point where we could really understand it as a magnetic object, but that was absolutely what we needed to then be able to start to understand things like flares, corona mass ejections, and these energetic particles. So I think I'll finish there and say thank you very much for listening.